That came from a song called uh, Medicine Train, which only appears on the CD and cassette. There's like 10 tracks on the actual disc final, mm -hmm. and on the CD and cassette, there's an um, 11 track called Medicine Train, and it comes from the second line of the second verse, which mm -hmm. is all wired up a desolation angel shooting from the hip in the Sonic Temple. And I kind of took that to mean like we're talking about the show and um, how like the contemporary venue, rock venue has become mm -hmm. more like a, I guess, I guess you could say like a religious experience. There's people we can relate to there, we can mm -hmm. talk rock music, we can talk, I don't know, people are just so much more open-minded there. Yeah. Like Billy was saying before, so many cultures coexist with each other. Like I've got friends who are in the rap scene. I've also got friends who are in rock bands. You know, mm -hmm. we've, all, we've all got something in common that we're all striving to be the best at what we're doing. Yeah. You know, I mean, here I don't think I'd probably hang out with very many people. You know. Yeah. Um, but Los Angeles, for the, for this point in time, is our base. It's where there's a lot of energy there. There's so many people gravitating towards Los Angeles coming from Europe. It's an amazing amount of people that yeah. are going there. A lot because of the rock scene and the movie scene and the fashion scene there, it's just exploded. I mean, you know, different periods of time have the, a, a major city in the world as a central point. At one time it was London, the swinging si 60s, you know. At one time it was Paris, you know. Mm -hmm. At one time it was New York, now it's Los Angeles. That's the energy center. With the electric album, we just wanted to sort of make a concise, blatant rock statement, mm -hmm. which is something we've been building up for a while. Yeah. We really want to go out and make just a, a solid rock album. I think with Sonic Temple, there was a part of ourselves, this, I like there's two very definite sides to the cult, there's like a more cerebral side yeah. and a more blatant rock side. And I think we, there's a more cerebral side, the more sensitive side of what we do was when we went in with Rick, we didn't really do anything with that, you know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we were writing songs like that when we were doing the 87 tour, we did the world tour in 87. And, uh, you know, with, with Bob, he, he looked at the overall picture and thought it'd be nicer to get a balance of the two sides of the cult, like a combination of the Love album and the electric album. Mm -hmm. So that's what we were hoping to achieve with the Sonic Temple record. Then I think in probably the period from 67 to what, about 73, 74, there was so much exploration going on in music. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably the most diverse period of music, certainly for rock anyway. Um, I don't know whether that will ever come around again. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think pretty much everything was explored, everything from incorporating ethnic sounds, you know, to um, incorporating different styles of music like jazz and reggae and psychedelia and rock all coming together mm -hmm. and blues. Um, now I think it's like, that was kind of like a melting pot. Now I think that, <clears throat> especially for ourselves, we're picking up, you know, our influences are more like the rock side of that kind of thing. I don't know whether there'll ever be more like a fusion. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I mean, what's new in music now is like electro beatbox kind of stuff. Yeah. But it's just a variation on a theme. I think that's what we'll continually see is, is variations on themes. But I don't think we'll ever see that kind of, you know, that scene ever happen again. You've got to remember, like, well, us three probably were, like, quite serious fans of punk rock. I mean, that's mm -hmm. probably why all of us got started. Yeah. We were punk fans who sort of learned to play and got our own bands and wanted to do something ourselves when the punk thing had become really kind of um, corporate and capitalised. It was we just about got it together to go and learn to play ourselves. So we all got in our own little different groups and had mm -hmm. certain amounts of success in the early 80s. But when we got together, it was out of a desire, probably having explored so-called alternative but style of music in a scene. We found it a bit like, um, I don't know, stultifying. It's like stymied. It was like loads of narrow-minded people. Like, you can't do guitar solos because that's like pre-punk and it was... Uh -huh. There was a lot of can't do's and we were sort of like feeling a bit more positive and I think about the time that um, She Sells Sanctuary was a hit, we went in to do the Love album um, and it was, we just basically were given carte blanche. So the, the vibe was, well, whatever you're doing, you're doing good because you've just got your first hit single, so let's have more of it. Mm -hmm. So we just went in and made the Love album and like anything, any idea that anybody came up with, we, we did. British journalists were quite cynical. They were like somewhat older than us and probably were like fans of music probably, you know, in their 20s when they were going to see groups like that. So they kind of felt like it was so precious mm -hmm. you know, and nobody else was allowed to be influenced by that style of music. And I don't know what it is about English music, avant-garde English music or whatever, people trying to create different things. They always tend to go towards intellect 
as opposed to like music for music's sakes. Mm -hmm. It's more about the actual image, the video, the, the record sleeve, the, you know, the, the, the clothes, yeah. you know, what they have to say as opposed to the music. Mm -hmm. And with us, you know, we just got sick and tired of that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. um, and we we've also felt we weren't being true to ourselves and our influences, yeah. you know. And with influences like, I mean, Led Zeppelin and the Stones and Free, you know, it's, um, you're obviously going to cop a little bit of flack because we were mm -hmm. probably one of the first bands to go out there and say, look, these are our influences, this is what we're into, mm -hmm. you know. But we didn't, like, take a piece of Led Zeppelin and go, like, put it there. Like Rick Rubin did in the hip-hop scene. Yeah. <laughs> Just nicked the whole guitar. It was, it was an influence. I mean, there's nobody that plays like Billy, there's nobody that sings like me, and there mm -hmm. never will be again. That's just the characteristics in the cult. Yeah. I think that's what makes people say that, that rock music is not a, you know, it's not a verified art form or whatever. It's not important. Um, I think that... With, with rock music, it's down to the characters of the people that are doing it. It's a legacy. It's been handed down since the old blues men, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's the, the people that, the new people that come in and sort of take over them, that makes it interesting. It seems like a lot of artists these days, you know, pop artists, rock artists, whatever, in Europe, the European perspective, the whole thing about, like, progressing to them is to make a, a video wackier than the one before it, so mm -hmm. that they, exactly. they place everything on the video. The song even becomes less important. Mm -hmm. And for us, one thing that we learned, that was to play on our strengths and not our weaknesses. We did a performance video uh, way, 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 way back mm -hmm. where we actually acted out certain scenes and we looked at it and it was totally embarrassing and one day it will surface and people will go, oh my God. Yeah, and a long I, time ago. That's what yeah. we were trying. What did you do? What did you do? What was the story? It was like a Victoria. It was supposed to be, the song was called Resurrection Joe and it was all based around a mm -hmm. sort of like a grave robber called Resurrection Joe. It was a bit yep. of a cutthroat guy. So it was all set around Dickensian London feel. Yeah, you know, very Sherlock Holmes, very Charles Dickens, and we acted out all these parts and played. We all played silly characters in it, it was <coughs> like garbage. Mm -hmm. and it was also done in shoestring budget. But um, we realised that you know it was like trying too hard. We're, we're trying to you know do something like really serious and very thoughtful, and we just realised that the best thing to do is just perform. That's what we're best at. I don't know about staging. I think. It was like the, the, the whole thing with like the Love Removal Machine video, the like endless walls of Marshalls, thank you Marshall. Mm -hmm. um, it was like, it went along with the album and to be honest the Love Removal Machine video was a little bit tongue in cheek. I mean we have got a sense of humour, I just don't think a lot of people get it. I mean, uh -huh, you know, yeah. I can count, I can see, I know it was ridiculous. Uh -huh. There was like 32 Marshall cabinets on stage or something, it was like... It was, you know, a video is not a real thing. It's a fake scenario. It is, it's like a moving photograph. It's, it's not a real thing. And people were going like, were they all plugged in? No, of course they weren't. We were miming. It's a video. Oh, it's even bigger than real. It's huge. <laughs> We've never it's been that close. Which camera? Are we, in, are we in on number one? Where did you get it? Um, I got it in Los Angeles about two years ago. Um, a guy called Bob Roberts mm -hmm. did it. Um, this He's trying to wash it off ever since. Yeah, he said it had come off, you know, and it was like... It was five hours doing it, actually. It took five hours. Is it like a Ch Chinese thing. dragon? Yeah, it's, yeah, I just, you know, I knew... I wanted something colourful and classic, mm -hmm. you know, something that I could live with, I suppose. You know? I, I remember waking up when I had it the next day after it. Yeah. Yeah. Traditional rock and roll fashion accessories, tattoos, you know, it's always the same thing. Yeah. Drugs, tattoos, women, whiskey, mm -hmm. fast cars. It's like, you know, there's an element of what we do in our everyday lives, which is there. I mean, I think we're, we're pretty much drug free band, you know, mm -hmm. alcohol plays a part occasionally. And of course, there's, a, you know, there's certain amounts of excessive lifestyle that goes on, as it would be for any young man in this kind of working <laughs> situation. <laughs> situation we, find kind of we are not a heavy band, you know, we're not trying to preach anything. Man. We just have a good time like anybody else. Uh -huh. Rock music, I mean, it's almost like, you, I, I feel like you have to sort of explain in Europe. I mean, it's like, because we've spent so much time in America, it's much more understood. I mean, Aerosmith coexists quite happily with Madonna and George Michael. They all get shown on the same TV yeah. But it's not so shows. over here. And it's very much more tribal in, in, in England. It's either you're into, like, disco, mm -hmm. or you're into funk, or you're into rap, or you're into rock, or you're into grass metal. It, it's a little bit sectional. I mean, we're very much like a traditional rock band. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what we've evolved into. That's what we feel comfortable with. There's a lots of good stuff out there. It's like thrash metal. That's like a new thing that's coming up, which 
it's it's not our bag, and that's really kind of a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But um, I suppose Metallica are the most well-known yeah. exponents of that. But there's loads of bands in Britain coming up for playing like that. Yeah, it's helped. I think anything for me, anything that's mm -hmm. like gets away from mindless disco drivel, you know, mm -hmm. is like a plus. And I like anybody that turns a guitar up loud and plays it nowadays because I'm just thankful for small mercies when I come here. I'm just personally sick and tired of seeing disco rubbish. That's, mm -hmm. that's what's played on the radio and it doesn't offend anybody and it's kind of bogus it's fake it's written by songwriters the artists are just cardboard cut out people who just go mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of sick and what it's doing is just making anybody with a bit of character and anybody who's got a real bit of individuality seem like a freak there is a madness that comes about because you become so disorientated mm -hmm. over a period of time you forget about regular lifestyles you know you're basically fed clothed looked after you mm -hmm. don't have to worry about anything who's paying the gas bill you know you're just out there so the whole thing is about an experience mm -hmm. and sometimes there's moments when you just sit there like say for example the first time I went to new orleans i was sitting in my hotel and i thought this is new orleans i've just got to get out there in the street and experience the place mm -hmm. you know and you just completely go yeah from bar to whatever mm -hmm. whatever to happens. bar to bar um, i think one thing that we have learned though is that when we were doing the electric world tour it was our longest tour that we'd ever done mm -hmm. so before that tour we were very naive very inexperienced now i consider us to be veterans we've been in the war zone so uh -huh. may, now we know how to control it a little bit more a little bit more moderation yeah we burnt ourselves out so quickly we having such a good time mm -hmm. we didn't know that we had to go for like 10 months you know, and when, when mm. the penny dropped and we realised that we had to be doing it for like another, I'd say three months into the tour, we began to realise it was going to be a very, very long time. You know, was, we were trying to catch up with ourselves, our health was gone, our minds were gone, it was just intense. But now I think we've learned, you know, to a little bit more power and control. American Indians <clears throat> is something I've been into on different levels since I was about 12 years of age. I lived in Canada mm -hmm. when I was like, about the age of 11 to 16 was exposed to American Indian culture there and I guess when punk rock happened there was a lot of questions coming up I was like an adolescent I was asking questions about everything and nothing made any sense to me Christianity didn't make any sense to me mm -hmm. um, what I was being taught at school didn't make any sense to me and my American Indian thing came back into focus again and all their values traditional values spiritual beliefs and everything meant more sense to me than you know the, the Bible or anything like that. Yeah. Although I do not, you know, I'm not against the Bible. I'm not against Christianity. It just no. didn't work mm -hmm. for me, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of American, a lot of American Indian themes, which are very, very natural themes, mm -hmm. come up in the in the lyrical content. Like on this album, we have a song called American Horse, mm -hmm. which has got a lot of American Indian content in it. But you will not see me standing on top of the the, the, um, the Grand Canyon sort of beating my heart going, warrior of the Cherokee. day. Cherokee. Uh -huh. No, it's like, that's pretty crass. I think it's pretty rude. Just using very strong earthy images like fire, na natural elements, for earth, wind, fire, and water. You yeah. know, man, woman, sky, mm -hmm. dirt. It's just like really natural, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and just, just the idea of the fact that we're all organic, we live on the planet Earth. We weren't sort of prefabricate. We didn't come out of a plastic bag, you know. Mm -hmm. But the earth is our home, and we should respect it a little bit more, you know. There's no gods, you know. Mm -hmm. There's no guy that's going to come out of the sky and zap you if you're bad, mm -hmm. you know. You don't go into a little box and and and, and say, excuse me for for my sins, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. It's just pretty much about you living with the earth and living in you know in, in that kind of environment. And there's nothing heavy or weird about it. No. You know, it's just a very natural thing. So I think probably most people would say that won't eat any kind of you know, structured religion, probably would feel a lot more comfortable with American Indian, but any kind of ethnic people, Aborigines, even people like the Laps, you know, or, or the Sumoy up in, um, you know, Iceland and people like that, the more natural people, because in Europe, we were running around until to, to about, probably about the year 700, we were just like earth people, really, Yeah. until we kind of like got more rational and conformed and industrialization, yeah. all that kind of thing. But of course, you know, talking about Talking about spiritual values and, and, and uh, things about the earth, it's starting to come more into focus now. I mean, people yeah. are starting to wake up to the fact that we are part of the earth, you know. And it's the like, cult was green it's, before Margaret Thatcher yeah, was well, it's, turned it's green. Not, it's not a joke it. anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not like, and people, you know, always look down the noses at anybody that's going to come up and say, what are you going to do about the, the, um, the rainforests? Mm -hmm. Or the earth is dying, what are you going to do about it? 
people go like, well, I'm going to go down a pub, you know, because I don't, I don't really care myself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not like really serious and heavy, you know, it's just being aware, yeah. educating people, making them aware of the fact that tomorrow this all could fall apart. <laughs>